Thanks so much for listening, everyone. We are so excited to be here with Mrs. Jen Robinson. And I am super, super excited to be sitting down with you today because you have an area of specialization um, that I think is going to be very interesting for our um, podcast listeners to tune into. So let's get started. <laughs> How long, Miss Robinson, have you been teaching? I've now taught in the classroom for, this is my sixth year, but before that, I was 17 years as a, as a support worker. Support worker. Yeah. And what, like, what did that look like for you? It was in the classroom working one-on-one -on -one or supporting classroom teachers. Um, sometimes I was in multiple classrooms. It's, it's the face of the SEA now, mm -hmm. but it was for the VSB. Vancouver School Board. Yep. Cool. Um, did you have an area, even then, an area of specialization that you, maybe um, a a like a age group that you really enjoyed working with yeah um, how it started was when I left and I, I did a counseling program at Douglas College and then I left and got on with the VSB and I was specifically they had a title and it was called the APW it was alternate program worker which mm -hmm. meant um, at that time there was no job banding so um, you were either working with children with profound special needs or you worked with kids that were behaviors so I was a direct behavior. I wouldn't have gotten called out or done jobs that were um, physical needs or anything like that, or autism. It was all strictly a behavior thing. Oh, very cool. So, and then it morphed in, you know, the changing of positions, and then you ended up being in schools, supporting in classrooms, and then um, you would be supporting in programs as well, because I worked in, in programs as well. Mm, very nice. Mm -hmm. um, did you prefer working with older kids or younger kids? Young, it's always been younger. I've, my career um, has always been K to seven, mm. always. What grade levels and subjects do you teach currently? I'm teaching K, um, which is new to me because I've all, well, it's not necessarily new. When I was in Vancouver, I was teaching a district behavior class that was turning into more kindergarten, but it was technically grade one to three, and it was tiered, like tier three kids there was nowhere they didn't fit into a typical classroom and they were in my room with two me my classroom a support worker a youth and family worker and 10 kids that was my maximum so it's always been but now i'm doing this k because with my social emotional learning um i found that i wanted to really get my hands on kindergarten so i could give them this social emotional learning from the out the gate of their school experience because I knew to me that was important like I think these skills are super important and um, they need to be woven into everything that you do and what I do every single day and you see the proof in the pudding right because oh, absolutely you're able to see how they're regulated how we talk about feelings and 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 it, that came from my experience in Vancouver working with kids that had none of these skills due to the vulnerabilities and the deficits that they came into my program having. Mm -hmm. So I realized at that moment how important these skills were. And I was like, I wanted to get my hands on a kindergarten class. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity in Langley. Yeah, you did. And, yeah. Uh, they're loving you, these kids, the, the kindergartners that we have. They're really, really excited to be in your room. Mm -hmm. And you have a very interesting, um, like... You have a very interesting calmness about your room and the way that your kids are able to regulate themselves so well. And it's, you know, it's February. We're halfway through and they can yeah. do so much already on their own. It's pretty incredible stuff. It just goes to show how important that social emotional component is. is. What do you find is the biggest problem uh, through your observations as an educator that has worked from K to 7, what do you find um, the behavior issues are when that piece has obviously been missing? I, you know, it's, it's hard because, you know, teachers throw out that word autonomy, mm -hmm. and I think this is separate from autonomy because if you don't look at the brain of a child, and I call it the square peg round hole syndrome, if you keep trying to jam a square peg into a round hole, it's never going to fit. And until you open up the, the realm of, of thinking that no kid is the same, no kid learns the same, you have to accept what level they're at and bring them up. But if you narrow-mindedly, I, I don't mean to be judgmental in that, but if you narrow-mindedly keep thinking, this is what it's supposed to be, this is a curriculum, this is what I'm supposed to teach... You're never going to get those kids, especially the behavior kids, because if you aren't flexible in your teaching on how you're dealing with kids and how you're not dealing with kids, 
you you can't you can't you can't teach them how to be flexible if you're not flexible in the way that you're dealing with them in your classroom. Gotcha. And that's the uh, that's what I find is the biggest piece that if you're not flexible and you're not and you have to have a relationship with these guys in order for them to trust you that they're going to be on this journey and you're going to teach them and bring them along to show them how they're supposed like uh, I hate having to say how they're supposed to be. That's not what it is. But it's you, more you, you've talked about explicit instruction. It's right? at, that is the key to everything. You have to, we, we, I think as educators assume that they're coming in, especially kindergarten, that they're coming in with these skills and more and more with technology, they are so completely tapped out but from, far behind, from far behind yeah, yeah, of knowing how do you talk to somebody? How do you interact with someone? And it's becoming more and more apparent that technology, I feel, this is my own opinion, is technology is really impacting the social emotional learning of kids mm -hmm. because they're detached. They don't have to listen. They're activated all the time. So they don't have to read their body and they don't know how they are feeling because they've been told how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they're, they're immersed in this fake world and now we're expecting them to work in the real world and then we're wondering why they're struggling. Mm -hmm. so. There's some really interesting research on screen time in children. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's out there. I've read some really interesting articles. I've seen some, <laughs> ironically, some very interesting videos on YouTube about how uh, technology and screen time in general affects yeah. children in just lots of different ways. And the first thing I always do with my families in because I always build a, I try to build a really good relationship with my families because I want them to trust me that I, I know what I'm doing and what I see when their kids are at school. Mm -hmm. So when I have that first parent interview, it's like, what's their bedtime? What does that look like? Tell me what that looks like. Um, what's their screen time like? And then that's when I start to insert the information that I, I know and I see because it comes out here is a simple act of giving your kid an iPad just before bed actually activates their brain. It doesn't bring their brain down. They're actually supposed to stop that an hour before you yeah. even bring them down because their brains need to know to turn off because there's so much stimulation, mm -hmm. your brain doesn't know it's supposed to be resting. As a parent, it's really interesting because I read that bit of research and we've actually started powering down even earlier. Mm -hmm. So I, for those of you who don't know very much about me in podcast land, I have a six-year-old son who is in grade one, um, very, very um, intelligent and very uh, sensitive. So struggles with big feelings and a very bright kid. But I find that if I do that one and a half hours before bed of even if he gets screen time half right. the time, he doesn't even bother because we're busy playing a board game or busy doing his sight words yeah. or busy doing something different. Um, I find that that really, really makes a difference mm -hmm. on their, not even like uh, quantity, but quality of sleep. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, he's not as t tired in the morning. He's rested. He's feeling good and ready for the day. And he's, you know, not a big grump in the morning. And that, and that I makes tell, a difference. And I tell my class and we talk about it all the time because I say to them, I said, why do babies need to sleep so much? And I said, because they're growing. Mm -hmm. When babies are sleeping, they're growing. And your brains are still growing. And we all, they, my guys all know about the prefrontal cortex and the, the hippocampus and the amygdala. They know all that does and what they need to do to keep their brain healthy and sleep and eat and all those and exercise. And I tell them all the time, it's super important that they realize that when you're sleeping, you're giving your brain and your body time to grow and rest and get ready for the next day. Mm -hmm. So I try to make them a little bit responsible for it because I know six-year-olds aren't responsible for bedtime. They just aren't. Mm -hmm. It's the parents. Yeah. You can't fault a six-year-old if their parents letting them go to bed at 10 o'clock. Yeah, but no. I know I can insert that yeah. <laughs> throughout my day here mm -hmm. saying this is what you need. Because yeah, do I have two or three of them that are I know are staying up late and they're watching TV or playing on a tablet or computers and and how, you know, I can just do and insert and give them the information that they can start to sort of make a bit of a decision about that. You talk a lot about what you feel like kids need to be successful. You've told me, you know, personally as a as a mother of a six-year-old coming to you for advice on regulation <laughs> and as a co-worker uh, with your own kids, but you, you've emphasized that they need love, discipline, and structure. Absolutely. Consistency, predictability. And I tell these guys from the outset, like, we, I'm like, what are we? We are a family. And we, if, when I frame it like that, we start to, it shifts the responsibility. They start to talk about 
um, looking after each other and it kind of naturally flows into that but the predictability part of that takes away their anxiety because if they know what's happening and they feel safe it's amazing the learning that happens because they're willing to take chances in their learning yeah. the predictable the consistent and they all know <laughs> And I say this all the time. They know where I stand. Mm -hmm. They know. They're like, they can process and know. If I've done this, I know this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, gray area for them mm -hmm. because I'm pretty consistent in, in my message. And with your discipline tactic as well. Right. Like, right. I, I find that you're very consistent about that. And they know. It's like, if they do something out of line, it's really interesting because they'll almost go and put themselves. Yeah, they like, figure it out. They figure it yeah. out. Yeah, it's really interesting. So what I, I think that our interest, our listeners are particularly interested in is um, if you have any stories about what particularly got you into education, in the field of education, because I know you said you did 17 years uh, being a support worker and then you, you went back to school and did your teaching. Mm -hmm. So was there something in your life uh, or s some person or some situation that really got you thinking, I should go into education, I should go into teaching? Well, I had an admin who pulled me aside and said, I don't know if you know about this, but SFU has a program specifically de designed for people with already has this experience. Um, and it's workable. Like, it's not like you're, you don't have to miss school. You don't have to miss work. Um, so also oh, bridging your support work gap to yeah. the actual classroom. So you still gap. had to yeah. apply, and what I didn't real what I didn't realize was it's actually more competitive than PDP is. Wow. I so know. what was the program name? It's called the Professional Linking Program. Oh, so it's PLP. Gotcha. So PLP, and uh, I applied and I got in. I didn't think I, I was an adult learner. Like I think I got accepted when I was 40, 40. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it took 16 months, but you did uh, nights, sometimes weekends, um, in the summer, you know, and then the VSB at the time, I don't know if the other districts were, but the VSB at the time gave me a 10-week leave of absence to do my practicums. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's and incredible. it was good because a lot of the places, you know, where they were placing students, we got placed in some pretty vulnerable areas because we'd already worked in them. Mm -hmm. Like, most of my career... <laughs> Most of the, my career was on the downtown east side. So, you know, I was working at, you know, some of the most vulnerable schools in the Vancouver School Board. So I already had that behind me. Right. And then going into the PLP and then became a teacher. And then, and now I'm in my master's. Mm. <laughs> big girl. Oh, big girl pants. Big girl pants. <laughs> but the, I think, I think the ultimate piece was I had an administrator that was talking about how um, how she she saw me as an educator and she kind of you know just says you need to you need she she actually looked at me and says you need to do this I'm not I'm not I'm not taking no from you mm -hmm. and I was pretty comfy mm -hmm. owned my house yep was with my long-term partner yep. did I, I didn't need to change my life it was great and then when I did I didn't, I, there wasn't one second that I didn't look back. And then when I, when I finished my program within a week, I got a call going, yeah, we have an opportunity and we're not letting you say no. <laughs> so you start next week. And that was my slide into, um, the, um, behavior program. Gotcha. So I really love to know if there has been an instance, maybe this year or even when you were with us back in when you were teaching the grade one class, is there um, a specific student who you observed maybe showing a lot of growth uh, as a result of your uh, work with them on social emotional, um, you know? Sure. Uh, well, I think, well, you know, there was lots when I was in my program because my day was about social emotional learning. It was all about, you know, programs and whatever. But um, I think the best one would probably be when I taught one, two here. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of grade ones and they came up and they had no confidence. Um, one of them was about to hit reading recovery and uh, would just, he would just power down. The second he thought he couldn't do somebody, he would, he would do the, you know, the horrible self-talk of, I can't do it. I'm stupid. This is, I, I can't, you know, we all have that kid in our class that does that, but it's on how you frame it and how you teach them how to get out of that. And it took a long time. 
And the best part is, is now, um, when I came back to this school to teach kindergarten, those parents of those kids that I had to work really, really a long time, um,